The woods is a great place to be any time of the year here in the UP. Right now it's late summer and we're looking for blueberries. We're going to go today and see if we can find some wild blueberries. And we'll take a look at harvesting birch bark and why. Stick around, it's time for 906 Outdoors. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. Picking blueberries is a pastime shared by many. It's a peaceful, relaxing, and tasty way to spend a day in the woods. So it's July, it's midsummer here in the Northwoods, and that means uh, a couple different things. First and foremost, that means that it is berry season. Uh, blueberries and service berries kind of kick it all off. Um, and we're gonna go today and see if we can find some wild blueberries. <laughs> So as we walk in here, um, there are a few trees that blueberries really seem to like to grow around. First of all, blueberries like uh, barrens or soils that are rocky and almost nutrient deficient. They, also, they like a lot of rocks and uh, moss and lichen and things like that. But in particular, um, they do work well with trees. We are already starting to see blueberries. Start with a milk jug. And so I've got a piece of string, or in this case, uh, old uh, river tie down from the days when I was a whitewater guide. But we're just gonna cut a little bit of this out, big enough for our hand to go in, so we can put blueberries in. And this is a real cheap, easy way to have a berry picking device. And it's less likely to spill because you have to tip it up almost all the way over to get the blueberries out. And of course, cutting down and away from the body. that little turn. A picking device, so blueberries in. And it's a little bit harder to get them out and eat them out of this, so that's always a nice thing. So I like to just do this. Put it around me, just like this. Adjust it to whatever height I'm picking at, so I can literally go hands-free right into the to the milk jug. So when we look at the blueberry plant itself, you can see it has leaves that grow not opposite of each other, as in there would be two right here. So they're staggered all the way up. When we look at them, a lot of times these blueberries come in a nice little cluster, two, three, four, etc. So I just pick a whole cluster right in. And then I'm trying to leave as much of the green berries on the plant as possible because wildlife does love them. So you should always be conscious of your surroundings. So there's basically two different kinds of, of blueberries across the globe. When we think of blueberries that you pick, et cetera, those are called high bush, right? And they're different species within that realm, but basically they grow tall, very tall. Not uh, too uncommon to see them be bigger than you, taller than you. And there's low bush berries, and that's the wild blueberries. Low bush, call that because they're low, and they, they put off runners, which is a piece of the plant that goes, and then it forms a foothold, and then from there it continues to spread. The Native Americans used to burn these patches to promote the, uh, the growth. In our particular area here around Iron Mountain, there's a big area called the Spread Eagle Barrens in Spread Eagle, Wisconsin. And that's historically a place where my ancestors set fire to that area to promote both uh, vegetative grasslands, which attracted large herds of animals, but also blueberries in particular. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Race Driven. Get in touch with your adventurous side and find your drive with Race Driven. As an online retailer, dealership, and manufacturer, we can provide power sport enthusiasts with virtually any part or accessories for ATV, UTV, and motorcycles. Customer driven, quality driven, race driven. Yeah, there's some good ones here. Juicy. 
you see a lot of times it's a lot of work for these you know they are so tiny but at the same time you can pick four five six in a, a single handful pretty easily if you get on a good spot You know, it's one of those things you never ask a blueberry picker, where'd you get those? Just like mushrooms, we don't tell. Uh, we got them at the getting place in the woods or uh, out there. And uh, there's plenty of them around. Um, probably the best public land resource I could recommend to anyone if you really wanted to do a lot of blueberry picking in a short amount of time is the spread eagle barrens because they're literally everywhere out there. pretty important when we're looking at uh, blueberries we make sure we're getting the right thing now blueberries can darken with age and so they can look like other things now this particular berry is not a blueberry we're gonna peel it off and you're gonna see right away it has a hard woody pit blueberries do not have a pit they have fine tiny seeds I forget the name of that berry off the top of my head because it's inedible I don't really uh, try to keep track of all that stuff when we look at the plant structure, you can see two totally different plants going on here. One, this plant has much bigger leaves and much bigger, broader forking in the plant structure. Blueberries, more compact in nature for the plant. The leaves are going to be this blue-green early in the year, then turning to green, and then late in the year they'll turn purple. The blueberry blossoms are white in the spring and they're, uh, they're heavenly smelling and they're literally everywhere. And uh, really good plant for bees too, of course, if you have bees around. Really handy resource to have in general, some kind of field guide. This one is uh, more specific to our general area, so it says uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. And what I really love about this field guide in particular is it sorts the berries by their color, right? And so it will show you the color of the berry and that's kind of like your general find it. And then once you find that color, you're going to begin to look for the plant itself. So for in the case of blueberries, we're going to go to the blue section. I happen to know it's the first or second page of the blue section. So just what we're looking for here, low bush blueberries, small woody shrub, alternating leaves, occurs in summertime. Of course, you can see the range here with the Great Lakes. There are no true toxic lookalikes. There's some pretty important identification characteristics of blueberries. When we look at the top of the blueberry, you can see that it has these very characteristic of, uh, characteristic of blueberries, the little points, almost like a star on top, like five points in particular. Between that and the leaf structure, it's pretty hard to mess up blueberries. Always, 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 if you're unsure, consult an actual expert, not an internet expert, but an actual expert that's living and breathing that you can talk to and show the berries to in person. Better to be safe than sorry. When in doubt, throw it out, right? What that means is, especially for young children, is to teach them that if they don't know for sure that it's okay to throw it away and waste it, as opposed to eating something that's potentially toxic or hazardous. Uh, most of the berry-related poisonings are either immigrants from another country who used to have a berry that looked similar in the old country and now they're eating it here. Uh, same thing with mushrooms, kind of in that same ballpark, or they're small children. Small children, of course, things go in the mouth. So if you take your three, four-year-old out to berry picking, well, they may have a hard time differentiating between a blueberry and a nightshade berry later on. And they see a nightshade berry, which is pretty common around here, especially uh, in suburbia and in town and on farms. And they eat those. It won't kill them, but it will make them pretty ill. Um, and if you've ever had a sick toddler, that's never any fun. So very important that we get the right berries at the right time. So if you're not finding them in the sun, come over to the shade line. A lot of times in the shade, they're about a week, week and a half behind what's in the open sun. Plus, it's cooler in the shade, so if it's a hot day like this, picking in the shade is much more relaxing than picking in the sun. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. 
It's time to make you hungry. Brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. On today's menu, fish sandwich. Battered deep fried Lake Michigan lake trout topped off with some onion rings and cheddar cheese. Six Outdoors is brought to you in part by NutraFeed, nutritional feed solutions for deer and horses. Bujou, get the gabujou, indigenica, zajijak, and do them. We quay down and do Japan, Jibwe, Nishinaabe, Nini, and Dao. So, my name is Jerry Jandro. I am a tribal member from the Kiwana Bay Indian community. And um, I was asked to come out and help with a uh, birch bark um, harvesting workshop. Uh, we have a guest, uh, Mina, who's here from Finland, uh, another culture that has um, some deep roots with the uh, birch trees, um, showing uh, some of their methods of harvesting to make uh, musical instruments and other uh, utilitarian uses. And I'm out here to uh, also share a perspective from some of the, the teachings that I've had about uh, the proper harvesting techniques uh, to ensure that the, the trees remain healthy after you harvest the bark. And, and for the people that don't know uh, about harvesting the, the bark, I think I've heard a lot of comments of, about, uh, uh, you know, we're killing the trees when we do this. And, and that's why it's very important to know what you're doing because you can kill the trees, but if you do it at the right time and using the right methods, the tree is absolutely fine. And so we've, uh, we've coexisted, you know, as, a, as Ojibwe people and with the Wigwasatig for a very, very long time. Um, and you can do it in a way that, uh, that doesn't hurt the tree um, and, it, and it can share its gift with you. So. And so there's typically a window um, in the summer, kind of about middle June to the middle of July, um, where the trees actually give their bark up. Uh, and you don't want to cut in too deep. You don't want to cut into this cambium um, this cork cambium part of the tree because uh, that's what it uses to transport its water and nutrients. So if you if you cut too deep in there, you'll disrupt that flow and you're you're essentially girdling that tree and so it'll die. But if you if you're gentle with it and, and how you go in to get that bark, if you just go into this these um, these layers up here, uh, when the tree is ready, it will give you that bark freely. Small little incision. go too much and what you want is if you can work that up and get to that uh, that corky cambium layer you can just feel the, the bark of the inside and if it's nice and wet then you know it's ready and if it's it's kind of dry to the touch then then just leave it and then if you just do these little these little test spots like that um, it's not going to make a big difference and then when you do start then that's you can actually incorporate that into what you're, if you're doing the strips, you can incorporate that into it. I do the sheath, so I'll just, I'll cut on this line when it is ready and then that's all that's, you know, you're not, you're not losing a lot of bark that way. When you start cutting into this bark and it's ready to give, um, it'll essentially pop off of the trunk. See you how know, it's popping a little bit? Mm-hmm. So it's really important to be very gentle when you're doing this or to at least have someone show you how to do it properly before you try to do it yourself. And when you're, when you're actually harvesting the bark, you only want to take what you're going to be using. And so if you have a project in mind or something, you only take what you need. Sometimes that inner layer likes to stick. So you might have to drag, drag it through a little bit more. If you find a really nice stand of birch bark trees, uh, don't go in there and just take everything. Just one tree, maybe two trees will do it. 
if you do it at the right time, then you'll have you know that those trees there for for many many years. And then also make sure that if you're going to be harvesting uh, bark from these trees, always always take a look at the tree as well. Um, you want to make sure that you're harvesting from a healthy tree because this, when you take this bark, you're, you're stressing the tree. When you look at the, the tree itself and you look up top and you see some of the crown dying back and stuff like that, or you may see some other uh, deformities on the bark, that tree is, is likely already stressed. And by taking the bark, you're, you're adding another um, stressor to it. And so um, making sure that those trees are healthy enough to share with you is really important as well. It's also important to remember not to harvest birch bark from private property without the landowner's permission. Public land agencies require permits for harvesting any type of bark or trees. And we find a good site and healthy trees that are capable of sharing with us. Um, we always uh, give something back um, and we always introduce ourselves as well. So we let them know who we are, where we come from and why we're there. You know, if you're going to be making baskets or you're going to be using it for ceremony, um, that's what you'll let the trees know when you, when you come here. It allows us to sort of uh, pause for a little while and remember why we're there and remember that we're taking something from another living being. Let the trees know that we have a, a good group of people that are out here uh, trying to reclaim their identity and their culture. Um, and I ask them to continue sharing their gift with us so that we can continue to live uh, what we call Minobama Dezi Win or the good life. During the treaty, treaty period of 1842 and 1854, uh, the Anishinaabeg people of uh, the Western UP, Northern Wisconsin and uh, over in Eastern Minnesota as well, we had ceded millions of acres of land to the United States government. And in doing that, we also retained our rights to utilize um, the land itself and, and birch bark is a big part of that. It's a big part of our culture and it's a big part of our identity. The birch tree is, uh, is a teacher. When we do have people out here interacting with these, these trees again, uh, they're able to hear some of those stories or they're able to get some of those teachings that the, that the birch has to offer. Um, and I think that's really important um, for people in general to, uh, to get back to nature. So. Be sure to watch next week when the birch bark gets made into a trumpet. Yeah. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works. Rapid River Knife Works is the largest custom knife factory showroom in Michigan. Hunting knives, pocket knives, and kitchen knives. Watch your custom knife being made and engraved. Free laser engraving with your personal message or company logo. Lifetime warranty on every knife and free sharpening. Bring the family and visit Rapid River Knife Works today. My name is Minna Hokka and I live in Koskitel in Finland, Southwest Finland. Teaching workshops in folk school and my desire and task is to teach people how to build traditional wind instruments that has been, have been used in Finland and Karelia from the late Stone Age to 1950. Take one strip that goes around, pull downwards and with loose eye, I try to get it as wide as possible. If I want it, want wider than this, then I can make with knife a spiral that goes all the way down. Minna said the ideal width of the strip is at least two inches and at least 20 feet long for a small trumpet. Now we can test what kind of horn it would be. 
Minna trimmed the starting end a little narrower and scraped off any bumps or rough spots that would cause the layers not to fit tightly against each other. Next, she started by wrapping the bark around a small stick. A couple of times around, layers are covering each other to get it a little bit more convenient to blow. Then we start to add length. Half about goes to on previous layer. Tightly against each other, no air should escape between layers. Little bit oh, taken away from here. Only that part that going under the next layer. Then you could start making carve, carvy. In 2007 or 8, I was asked to have give workshops and concerts with these instruments and that has also kept me going on this path because people want to learn these instruments and I don't want to be the last one who makes these and it's very much fun to play together these instruments. To close the end layers together, Minna sharpened the ends of a stick and poked it through the end of the trumpet. She showed us other methods of fastening the end with handmade clothespins or small sticks boiled to soften them and thread it through the bark. It doesn't really give too good sound yet. Glue would help and maybe it gets open too fast. Those models that are made of little bit thinner birch bark have a little better qualities. I could play the other one. Alright, now how do I do this? Um, at first, yes, keep your lips together and make this kind of sound. Yes, Not lips like are vibrating against each other. And you can have more air pressure and less air pressure to get high tones. You need more air pressure and pretty kind of angry looks. I would say. <laughs> Give some. Continue. I want to people feel they are musical too, even though somebody might have told different things, and if they have just. They haven't found the right instrument <laughs> before. <laughs> it's so wild. <laughs> it takes time to tame it.